So we're going to uh, start the first lecture, which is a history of pre-Darby rapture advocates. And when we started this organization 20 years ago, our first meeting, as far as I know, the only uh, people that, believe, that we could identify from hi church history as having believed in the pre trib rapture was Darby in 1828, basically, is when Darby first uh, started teaching or first came to the idea of the pre trib rapture. It took him another 10 to 12 years before he started teaching it because he wanted to vindicate it in his own mind. And since then, we found seven or eight other people down through church history who have taught the preacher of rapture. And I think one of the things that this demonstrates is that uh, people were not looking, historians and others were not looking for it. And the movement that we are part of began as a Bible teaching movement. It was not that interested in church history, but it began as a Bible teaching movement and most of its scholars and, uh, and uh, champions, so to speak, were Bible teachers and theologians, not church historians. And as time has gone on, uh, the preacher of rapture has grown uh, very widely in the United States and, and actually around the world, wherever missionaries have gone, uh, it, that message has gone as well. And so I think there's more of a sensitivity by scholars and other people who are, are, are looking for these kinds of things. And so this is one of the main arguments that is brought up against pre-tribulationalism. That's why we're addressing it at this conference where we are speaking primarily, uh, in fact, every talk is about the pre trib rapture at this conference. Uh, we have gone some years where we only had like one paper maybe that related to the pre trib rapture because we deal with all eschatological issues, pretty much. Not, we haven't covered everything, obviously, but we have dealt with a wide range of eschatological issues. So this year at our 20th anniversary, we're focusing on uh, the preacher of rapture specifically. And the historical issue is, if you've been out there preaching or teaching the preacher of rapture, it's a, it's a legitimate question, how come if the preacher of rapture is taught in the Bible, how come people did not see it for so long? And one of the things we're saying is that you have the development of uh, Bible teaching where 200 years ago you had a revival of futurist eschatology. In other words, the teaching of the Bible from a futurist position like the early church held. And it wasn't until the last 200 years that you've had the implications of that being worked out. And uh, therefore, uh, pre-tribulationalism grew among Bible-believing Christians. Obviously, liberals and left-wing people, whether they lived in California or not, uh, actually, California is one of the places where the pre-trib rapture grew uh, very strongly. And uh, nevertheless, uh, it is something that uh, has come on in the last couple of hundred years, and so people have been criticizing it now for the last 150 years or so. So they say that is one of the criticisms is, if it was taught in the Bible, then how come there's not a record of it being taught uh, throughout the church? So, uh, and I admit it wasn't widely taught, although we're finding people who did teach it. So when you deal with the history of the rapture, uh, not because it is the basis for determining truth, which can only be found in Scripture alone, but because these issues are often at the heart of the critics of pre-tribulationalism. Charles Ryrie has rightly said the fact that the church taught something in the first century does not make it true. And likewise, if the church did not teach something until the 20th century, it's not necessarily false. Uh, Norm Geisler has stated that heresies can be early, even in apostolic times. And if you read the New Testament, you know there was a lot of heresy that they were dealing with, even uh, in the early church. And rediscovery of some truths can be later, like the preacher of rapture. So with this in mind, let's, we're going to look at church history and look at people who I think 
taught some form of pre-tribulationalism before Darby in 1828. And so how do you find the rapture in history? Well, I thought we would use William Bell, who is a critic of pre-tribulationalism, who wrote a dissertation in 1967, a Dallas Seminary graduate who went astray somewhere. Did you have Dr. Bell? Okay. Uh, you, you, do you want to suggest where he might have gone astray? We had questions about it while he said Ah, and you let him through anyway. He, he said that uh, he had, they questioned Dr. Bell when he was getting his Master of Theology at Dallas about these issues and things. But he then went to New York University and wrote a dissertation against pre-tribulationalism. And one of the things he has in that dissertation is four things that you need to look for to find a pre-trib rapture in church history. And he says that of his four criteria, if you can find one, of any one of these in church history, then he said that would be a legitimate uh, find of a pre-trib rapture statement. And so those four criteria are, number one, any mention that Christ's second coming was to consist of more than one phase separated by an interval of years. So, in other words, that would be the, a two comings view separated. I, I would add to that, not just an interval, but a, the time of tribulation. So, uh, then secondly, any mention that Christ was to remove the church from the earth before the tribulation period. And then thirdly, any reference to the resurrection of the just as being in two stages. And then fourthly, any indication that Israel and the church were to be clearly distinguished, thus providing some rationale for removal of Christians before God, quote, again deals with Israel, unquote. In other words, the dispensational factor there of the distinction between Israel and the church. So uh, that's what we're using here. Now, some have thought that the Shepherd of Hermas, which is dated around 140, although I think some dated as early as 90. Yeah, uh, so it's one of the earliest post-apostolic uh, documents of the early church. And he talks about a vision that he had of, and he uses metaphor of the tribulation, this great beast that comes, represents the tribulation, and then he sees this bride who's dressed in white, and she represents the church. And so he talks about a dialogue between he, Hermas, and uh, the church, and he, he, uh, he bids her good morning and all of this kind of stuff. And I say unto her, lady, such a huge beast that can... Uh, could have destroyed whole peoples, but by the power of the Lord and by his great mercy, I escaped it. Thou didst escape it well, uh, she said, because you did cast thy care upon God and didst open thy heart to the Lord, believing that thou canst be saved by nothing else but by his great and glorious name. Therefore, the Lord sent his angel which is over the beast, which is named Sergei, and shut its mouth uh, that it might not hurt thee. And so uh, he, it goes on and says, Thou, you have escaped a great tribulation by reason of thy faith. So it goes on and talks about the possibility of escaping the tribulation. But when you analyze the entire vision that he's talking about, his uh, definition of escaping the tribulation is more like making it through the tribulation. And so uh, pre-tribulationalists, along with post-tribulationists, agree that Hermes talks about escaping the tribulation, but he really is not a pre-tribber, if you see what I'm saying. So he is probably a post-tribulationalist, but he's not very clear, and he has language mixed in uh, about uh, the possibility of escaping this. So... Uh, John Walvoord argues that the central feature of pre-tribulation is the doctrine of, the, of imminency and that it is a prominent feature of the doctrine of the early church. So pre-tribulationalists have, have looked at the teachings of the early church and they say they do not, as far as we've been able to find, state 
uh, a pre-trib rapture in the way that we would state it today in the 21st century. I almost said it. Uh, and But they expected Christ to return at any moment, which is a pre-trib rapture belief. And so you have a statement in Irenaeus. Irenaeus wrote around 170, 180. Uh, his essay is called Against Heresy. And by the way, his last five chapters were suppressed by the medieval church. And you have a number of examples, starting around the 500s or so, of the medieval church, Roman or Catholic or Greek or whatever, that suppressed premillennialism as a whole. And so they tended to uh, not copy eschatological related um, writings by the early church fathers. And so his lost five, last five chapters of his Against Heresies, which is a very developed futurist premillennialism, uh, you know, was suppressed and it wasn't discovered until 1587, around there. And some scholars have credited the rediscovery of the lost five chapters of Irenaeus along with a footnote in Romans chapter 1136 in the Geneva Bible of 1660 as reviving premillennialism. And uh, those two events led to, by the 1600s, of the, the Puritans being predominantly premillennial. And uh, I'm going to tell you later about a number of pre-tribulationalists in the 1600s that appear to be uh, surfacing at this time. And so Irenaeus, who had a very developed uh, view of eschatology, uh, said this, therefore when in the end the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, he's talking about the tribulation, it is said there shall be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning nor uh, neither shall be. For this is the last contest of the righteous in which when they overcome, they are crowned with uh, incorruption. So even though he talks about the possibility of being caught up, and he has a number of other statements like this in his writings, at the end of the day, I think most of us would agree he's really a post-tribulationalist uh, because he's talking about a victory the church wins through the tribulation, et cetera, and things like that. So he uh, apparently blended the rapture and the second coming as a single event. However, the very next statement speaks of believers in the tribulation, so that's why uh, we, I believe he's not teaching pre-tribulationalism. Now, Charles Ryrie says that pre-tribulationalist uh, pre-tribulationalist view of imminency is defined as following. It means impending, hanging over one's head, ready to take place. An imminent event is one that is always ready to take place. So, meaning it could happen at any moment is another term we like to use. Uh, and we always like to point out that if other events have to happen, like the signing of the covenant or the appearance of the Antichrist uh, or any of these kinds of things uh, have to take place, then that is not an imminent event. Because if anything has to happen before the rapture takes place, then obviously the rapture couldn't happen in any, in any moment. It has to wait for these other events to occur. So uh, with that definition of imminency in place, some have recognized that it is common for anti-Nicene writers to speak of an imminent return of Christ, especially during the first century after the apostles. Patristic scholar Larry Crutchfield argues that uh, the early church fathers believed in what he calls an imminent intra-tribulationalism. Uh, and he believes that the early church believed that they were either in the tribulation or on the verge of being in the tribulation. And so they didn't think of things like we did today. So uh, they talk about being in the tribulation today, in their day, and being raptured out of that or taken out of that in that way. Um, and so Crutchfield says, in some, with few exceptions, the premillennial fathers of the early church believed that they were living in the last times. Thus, they looked daily for the Lord's return. See, that was the focus of their, of their imminency. Even most of those who looked for Antichrist's appearance prior to the second advent saw that event as occurring suddenly, 
and just as suddenly being followed by the rescue and rapture of the saints by Christ. So this belief in the imminent return of Christ within the context of ongoing persecution has prompted us to broadly label the views of the earliest fathers imminent intra-tribulationalism. I mean, after all, if you get a PhD, you have to come up with words like intra-tribulationalism, right? You can't just say they're in the tribulation, right? <laughs> you got to have words like intra. I remember I coined a term one time in an article I wrote called neo, uh, theonomic neo-postmillennialism. I thought I was real proud of myself on that one, but nevertheless, <clears throat> He goes on and says, it should be noted that dispensationalists have neither said that the early church was clearly pre-tribulationalist, nor that they are even clear individual statements of pre-tribulationalism in the fathers. As Walvard says, quote, the historical fact is that the early church fathers' view of prophecy did not correspond to what is advanced by pre-tribulationalists today, except for the one important point that both subscribe to imminency of the rapture. So this view of the Father's own imminency, and in some, the references to escaping the time of tribulation constitutes what may be termed, to borrow a phrase from Erickson, quote, seeds from which the doctrine of the pre-tribulational rapture could be developed, unquote. Had it not been for the drought brought by Alexandrian allegorization, and later by Augustine, one wonders what kind of crop these seeds might have yielded before Darby and the 19th century. Well, you know, there has been some crop that we've recently discovered, and that's the point. When you, if you were to take a map of the early church, where, where churches were located, uh, for example, in Asia Minor or in Europe or in the Middle East or in North Africa, almost all allegorical interpretation for the first 300 years came out of North Africa, out of Alexandria. I think that's significant because it means that the rest of the church uh, took Bible prophecy literally. And what you had in Alexandria, Egypt, 2,000 years ago was the shift of the center of Greek philosophy from Athens to Alexandria. And so I think you have the poison in uh, the Eastern Church there of allegorical interpretation that produced Philo within Judaism and uh, then eventually, uh, who's that guy? Um, Origen and his teacher uh, that preceded him where they're trying to apply this four-leveled allegorical interpretive approach to all of Scripture. And the residue of that was that Augustine on the one hand rejected partially the Alexandrian school, but he accepted it in the area of eschatology. And this is called dual hermeneutics. In other words, where you interpret prophecy allegorically, uh, which is clearly, I mean, if you read the scholars on this, they all admit this is a result of Greek philosophy coming into a Bible interpretation. Uh, and that is why by the 400s, you begin to have uh, with Jerome, Jerome and uh, Augustine uh, the overwhelming of premillennialism and the entrenchment of, Alex, of uh, Augustinian amillennialism by the early Middle Ages. And so uh, getting rid of that uh, did not occur until the Reformation when the church began to go back to the historical, grammatical, contextual method of interpretation, at least partly and in theory. They didn't actually begin to implement it. And the Puritans come along and they began to start interpreting Bible prophecy more literally. They had a ways to go themselves because they were trapped in historicism. And so the early 1800s is when futurism began to be revived within a premillennial context and almost immediately you have the rapture, the s distinction between Israel and the church and these kinds of things as eschatology is the last major area in systematic theology to be developed in a historical sense. And so uh, historian Kurt Allen sees the early church's imminent expectation of a large return 
where he says, up until the middle of the second century and even later, Christians did not live in and for the present. What does that tell you about our culture today? But they lived in and for the future. And this was in such a way that the future flowed into the present. That future and present become one. Now that's his uh, German explanation there. And we'll, we'll excuse all of that. But I think he's right, uh, generally. A future which obviously stood under the Lord's presence. It was the confident expectation of the first generations that the end of the world was not only near, but that it had already come. And it was definite conviction, not only of Paul, but of all Christians of that time, that they themselves would experience the return of the Lord. And so he begins to see, Kurt Allen the decline of true eminence around A.D. 150. So he says, as soon as the thought of a postponement of the parousia or the return of Christ was uttered once, and indeed not only incidentally but thoroughly presented in an entire writing, it developed its own life and power. At first, people looked at it as only a brief postponement, as the Shepherd of Hermas clearly expresses. But soon as the world, end of the world did not occur, it was conceived of as a longer and longer period until finally, <clears throat> uh, this is today's situation, nothing but the thought of a postponement exists in people's consciousness. And, and that's really true. Uh, we just really do not function, even in our circles, uh, the way the early church did when it came to the possibility of Christ's return. Um, hardly any longer is there the thought of the possibility of an imminent parousia. Today we live with the presumption, I would say almost from the presumption, that this world is going to continue. It dominates our consciousness. And boy, you better not say that publicly in some public forum or you'll get blasted won't you, if you talk about uh, the possibility that this present world as we know it could end by Christ or God interrupting uh, the current trajectory that we're on. And he goes on and says, practically we no longer speak about a postponement, but only seldom does the idea of the end of the world and the Lord's return for judgment even occur to us. Rather, it is pushed aside as annoying and disturbing in contrast to the times when faith was alive. It is very characteristic that in ages when the church flourishes, the expectation of the end revives, he says. And we think of Luther, we think of pietism, if we judge our present time by its expectation of the future. And so I think that that's an excellent summary of, of the early church as juxtaposed to even our own day. Even post-tribulationists like J. Barton Payne also admit that the early fathers held to an eminency viewpoint. And he summarizes as follows, it must therefore be concluded that the denial of the eminence of the Lord's coming on the part of post-tribulationists who have reacted against dispensationalism is not legitimate. Belief in the eminency of the return of Jesus was the uniform hope of the early church and it was only with the rise of a detailed application of Bible prophecy at the close of the second century to yet future history that its truth was questioned. And that's a similar, I think, statement to what Kurt Allen is saying. So the early church held to eminency in a way somewhat similar to what we hold to today as pre-tribulationalists. And so that element was there in the early church. Now, we move on to the pseudo-Ephraim find, you know, that Grant Jeffrey, I remember the afternoon when he called me up and read this quote and said, you know, that was from the fourth century. Uh, and so we see Pseudo Ephraim is a guy who wrote on the last times the Antichrist, the end of the world, or a sermon on the end of the world uh, as early as the fourth century, though possibly, but I, I don't think so, as late as the seventh century. And you have uh, someone imitating uh, Ephraim the Syriac, who is still the greatest Syriac church father, you know, of, of the early church. And he wrote a, almost a 1500 word sermon in Latin, which was probably originally written in Syriac, then translated into Greek, 
and then into Latin as the church began to become more Latin. And so we have, you know, there's four or five copies of this, so there's a textual, I mean, there's a critical copy of his uh, sermon in Latin, and there are a number of uh, pieces of Greek manuscripts still in existence. There's two different uh, Greek traditions there, and the uh, there is a Greek text for the rapture statement here in this sermon. And his sermon is divided into ten paragraphs. And in paragraph two, he talks about the rapture. And then in paragraphs nine and ten, he talks about the second coming. So he's separating them out. And in between, he talks about the tribulation and the antichrist. And so just from an order of his sermon... It, it, it supports the idea of two comings of, of uh, separate returns of Christ. And here's his statement in the second paragraph. He says, We ought to understand thoroughly, therefore, my brothers, what, uh, what is imminent or overhanging. See, there's that idea. It's the Latin word from we get our English word imminent from, so I think it means imminence. What do you all think? Uh, why, therefore, do we not reject every care of earthly actions and prepare ourselves for the meeting of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he may draw us from the confusion. Now, confusion is a synonym he uses later on repeatedly for the tribulation. So it's clear that he's talking about the tribulation which overwhelms all the world. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered before the tribulation which is to come and are taken to the Lord in order that we may not see at any time the confusion, the tribulation, which overwhelms the world because of our sins. Now this fits, I think, three of the four criteria set out by uh, Dr. Bell. It's clearly a clear statement of being taken from the tribulation. That's what it says. All the saints and elect of God are gathered before, together before the tribulation. So pseudo Ephraim presents at least three important features found in modern pre-tribulationism. There are two distinct comings, the return of Christ to rapture the saints, followed by Christ's second advent to the earth. Secondly, a defined interval between the comings, in this case a three and a half year tribulation period. And then thirdly, a clear statement that Christ will remove the church from the world before the tribulation. So the fact that pseudo Ephraim placed the rapture three and a half years before the tribulation is not an argument for mid-tribulation. He appears that he believes that the entire tribulation was only three and a half years in duration. Even Darby originally believed the rapture would occur three and a half years before the second coming. <coughs> it wasn't until, I can't remember, 1843, 1845 that Darby uh, shifted to the seven-year tribulation period. And you find this commonly. Uh, Post-tribulational scholar Bob Gundry wrote an objection to pseudo Ephraim's sermon and, as a pre-trib statement. And he concluded, quote, pseudo Ephraim urges Christians to forsake worldliness and preparation for meeting Christ when he returns after the great tribulation. Meanwhile, Christian evangelism is taking people to the Lord and gathering them into the church. This interpretation puts the resurrection of Christians in their meeting of Christ at his coming after the tribulation to destroy the Antichrist, making imminent the advent of Antichrist rather than that of Christ. See, Bob Gundry just loves to see the Antichrist. That's the title of, of this particular book where he wrote a critique called First the Antichrist. He's looking for the Antichrist. Pre-tribulations are looking for Christ. The New Testament says we're looking for Christ. Sorry, I had to go on a little sermonette right there. Uh, as a result, but nevertheless, preacher of relations is Thomas Ice. That's me. Uh, pinned a rejoinder to Gundry's critique. I noticed that Gundry did not establish that pseudo Ephraim ever used gather in an evangelistic way as he contends. Further, I note that the late Paul Alexandri. Alexander, the Byzantine scholar who first published this statement in one of his books. That's the book that Grant Jeffrey read. And uh, I don't think Paul Alexander, Alexander, a Greek Orthodox guy, was trying to defend the pre-tribulational rapture. It's very possible he may not have even known this. After all, he was teaching out 
at Cal Berkeley, not exactly a hotbed of dispensationalism. <laughs> and, uh, but he understood this disputed passage as a pre-tribulational uh, tr transportation. He talks about how they're going to be taken out of the tribulation. That's how he understood it. And uh, so Gundry tries to, just like he does and often when he's trying to uh, twist the biblical text, in this case I think he twists the historical text by trying to say, well, gathering means evangelism. Well, I'm sorry, uh, the, he cites some instances in Ephraim, but we don't believe this was written by Ephraim. We believe it was written by someone under his name the pseudo-Ephraim, uh, he never showed one example in pseudo-Ephraim of him using gather in relation to evangelism. Plus, the context itself is very clearly evangelistic. The whole sermon is on the last days, the Antichrist, and the end of the world, you see. And so uh, he's trying to finesse that, but he doesn't succeed. He also points out that there are Christians during the tribulation. Well, guess what? We believe, as pre-tribulationists, there's there's believers or Christians during the tribulation because they start getting saved after the rapture. Is that a hard thing for us to explain? I don't think so. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think here you have a, uh, for, in the late 300s, a pre-trib rapture statement. It's not set within a dispensational framework. In fact, I would argue that the distinction between Israel and the church, not the rapture, is the last thing that developed in church history that resulted in uh, dispensationalism. The early church began to become anti-Semitic in replacement in their theology, which is probably one of the main reasons why they moved from premillennialism. The Middle Ages is certainly into replacement theology and anti-Semitism. And of course we know about the developments after the Reformation as well. And so uh, it's the distinction between God's plan for Israel and God's plan for the church, which is the last piece of theology that fits into our dispensational viewpoint that was developed. Darby really was one of the first to teach that. Wouldn't you agree, Paul? Yes. Uh, and had to get a little British consent there. <clears throat> But, he, you know, he wrote a dissertation at University of Manchester on this topic, so I think he knows a little bit about that. But then we move on to Brother Dalcino. Everybody knows Brother Dalcino, right? He's a member of your family somewhere down the road. <laughs> Just kidding, of course. But in A.D. 1260, a man named uh, Gerard, uh, Gerard Sagarello, who died in 1300, founded a group known as the Apostolic Brethren in nor Northern Italy, and he founded this order after he was turned down from membership by the Franciscan order. So in the Middle Ages, after Joachim de Feori, who is a watershed in eschatology, said, we've entered the age of the Holy Spirit, you had all of these orders being started in the Middle Ages of people who would uh, go off in monasteries and the monastic orders and preach the true gospel and all of this. There's a tremendous anti-Roman Catholic, anti-Pope mentality. In fact, Joachim de Feori, a Catholic, was the first to come up with the idea that the Pope was the Antichrist, well before Protestants even came on the scene. Just thought I would throw that out, uh, you know, because people say, oh, some Protestants think the Pope the Antichrist, that's anti-Catholic. Well. There were Catholics who first thought the view up. And uh, as a result, uh, the Pope had outlawed uh, any new, the making of or founding of any new orders. And so he had to do this outside the Catholic Church when he started his order. So at that time, it was against church law to form any new ecclesiastical order so that the apostolic brethren were subjected to severe persecution. In 1300, Gerard was burned at the stake, and a man named Brother Dalcino took over leadership of the movement. And under his hand, the order grew and eventually numbered in the thousands. End time prophecy eventually held an important place in the study and teaching of the apostolic brethren. See, because they saw the corruption of the Catholic Church, 
as a sign of the end times. So Brother Dalcino died in 1307, and in 1316, an anonymous notary of the Diocese of Versilia in northern Italy wrote a brief treatise in Latin that set forth the deeds and the beliefs of the apostolic brethren. And this treaty was called the History of Brother Dalcino. Francis Gumelock, a non-pre-tribulationalist, well, I would say so. He's a preterist post-mill. He's the guy that found this. So this was a find not not by someone in our camp who believes in the viewpoint. He's, in fact, he's opposed to us very strongly. And is the individual who recently discovered the bro uh, Brother Dalcino rapture teaching. At one point in the treaties in the Apostolic Brethren, the following paragraph appears. Again, Dalcino believed and preached and taught that within those three years, Dalcino himself and his followers will preach the coming of the Antichrist and that the Antichrist was coming into this world within the bounds of said three and a half years. And after he came, then he, Dalcino, and his followers would be transferred into paradise. So if you're a part of the thousands who are in this Brother Dalcino group, you'd be raptured before the tribulation. And in this way, they would be preserved unharmed from the persecution of Antichrist. And that then Enoch and Elijah themselves would descend on the earth for the purpose of preaching against Antichrist. Then they would be killed by him or by his servants, and thus Antichrist would reign for a long time. But when the Antichrist is dead, Dalcino himself, who then would become the Holy Pope. Isn't that great? He gets to become Pope at the end. I mean, that's a great story. <laughs> you get rid of the bad Pope, and you become Pope. And you're going to straighten everything out, right? That'd make a good movie, <clears throat> I guess. Um, and his preserved followers will descend on earth and will preach the right faith of Christ to all and will convert those who are living then to the true faith in Jesus Christ. So... That's Brother Dalcino, and several points in this statement are very similar to modern pre-tribulationism. I mean, this guy was probably an amil for all we know, but he held to two-coming view. The Latin word uh, transferentu, uh, meaning they would be transferred, is the same word used by medieval Christians to describe the rapture of Enoch in, into heaven. The subjects of this rapture were to be Brother Dalcino and his followers. In other words, the true believers. Uh, this was not a partial rapture because uh, they believe Brother Dalcino considered his apostolic brethren to be the true church in contrast to the Roman Catholic Church. Then the purpose of the rapture was to preserve the people from the persecution of the Antichrist, which is a classic pre-trib view. The text presents the transference of believers to heaven and the descent of believers from heaven as two separate events. And then the text also shows that quite a long gap of time must intervene between the rapture of the saints to heaven and the return of saints from heaven. So Gumerlach clearly believes that this is a preacher of rapture statement. He concludes, this paragraph from the history of Brother Dalcino indicates that in northern Italy in the early 14th century, a teaching very similar to modern pre-tribulationalism was being preached. Responding to distressing political and ecclesiastical conditions, Dalcino engaged in detailed speculations about eschatology and believed that the coming of the Antichrist was imminent. He also believed that the means by which God would protect his people from the persecution of the Antichrist would be through a translation of the saints to paradise. So it appears that Yakimist scholar Marjorie Reeves, uh, she's deceased now, a British lady, taught at Oxford, also saw a rapture associated with Dalcino. Uh, she says the apostolic brethren, quote, they, in other words, she's the top scholar of Joachim de Feori, which there's a whole school of scholars that study Joachim and uh, the medieval eschatology there. Uh, they would preach the imminent advent of Antichrist, and when he appeared, Dalcino and his followers would be removed to paradise while Elijah and Enoch descended to combat. combat. When the Antichrist was disposed of, they would de uh, descend again to convert all nations. So she recognized this as well. The Dalcino statement very well appears to have been uh, some form of two-stage coming, a rapture followed by a time of tribulation, concluding with the prior raptured 
saints returning at the second coming. However, such a view falls short of Darby's developed form of a rapture within a dispensational futures framework. But it's still some form of rapture. Then you have the case of Thomas Collier as we move into the Reformation period. Frank Moretta, a brethren researcher, believes that Thomas Collier, who died in 1691, in 1674 makes reference to a preacher of rapture but rejects the view, thus showing his awareness that there was such a view being taught in the late 17th century. Collier in his book, The Body of Divinity, says the following. Um, number seven, a question. At what time may we suppose the saints shall be raised at his first appearing in the clouds of heaven? or at the entrance of the thousand years, or after the thousand years are finished? Answer, very probably at the entrance of the thousand years, and that uh, for these reasons. So he's a premillennialist, but he's not a pre-tribulationalist. He says, one, because it is not likely that they shall be raised before the nations are subdued and the new heavens and new earth prepared. Secondly, the scripture saith that it shall be at the sound of the last trump. We uh, may groundedly suppose that after Christ appearing in the work, he may ascend and descend often. Collier can uh, certainly consider the idea of a preacher of rapture. If the saints were raised when Christ appears, this is prior uh, to the fulfillment of the bulk of Revelation. It is pre-tribulational, explains Moretta. Uh, whether anyone actually held a preacher view complementary to uh, Collier or this was just an exercise of the mind, we cannot say. So, uh, we have found um, that, I thought I had this in there, is that in there, in that particular thing, a note? No, I guess I have the wrong copy of my paper, but there was supposed to be a guy here today named William Wat uh, Watson who has a PhD from Cal Berkeley in 17th and 18th century British history. He's a professor at Colorado Christian University. And he believes he's found this mysterious rapture person that Collier refers to. And uh, he has written a paper, I have a copy of it, and he's found at least three more pre-tribulationalists in the 1600s. But he wanted to present the paper, and since he's not here, He's not allowed me to, to release the information because he wants to be the first to publish it because he discovered it. And he's, he says he's running across a lot of these people buried, uh, you know, in uh, English history because he now has access because they, they're putting all this stuff on the Internet where you can read these books. And he's going through and reading them and finding people who taught some form of pre-tribulationalism. I have read his paper, and he's right. Uh, he also has a, a, a master's degree from Talbot Seminary. You know, so he, he understands what he's looking for, and he's very excited about uh, some of the stuff that he's finding from the, by the Puritans from the 1600s of people who separated the rapture and the second coming. And so there, we've got others that are coming forth here, you see, with this kind of stuff. And also, Francis Goomerlock, I forget, forgot to tell you, sent Mark Hitchcock an email saying that he has three file drawers full of other pre-tribulational rapturists from the Middle Ages that he is hoping to write an, uh, an article or book uh, talking about. And so people that are going back and reading uh, the church fathers in Greek and Latin, which Goomerlock has a PhD in classics and is able to do, uh, they're finding pre-tribulationalists scattered throughout church history. Isn't that amazing? And it's only a matter of time till they uh, divulge who these people are. And so we're finding that more and more the pre-trib rapture view was present. And so that question where people say, well, if the pre-trib rapture was actually taught, uh, you know, why didn't more people see it? Well, I would suggest because of the, so, uh, the uh, oppression of the, of the Catholic and in some cases Protestants in the Middle Ages who suppressed premillennial writings in general. And uh, here you have the case of John Askell next, and this 
guy lived from 1659 to 1738, and he wrote a book in 1700 about the possibility of translation, in other words, a rapture without seeing death. In fact, the entire title is an argument proving that according to the covenant of eternal life revealed in the scriptures, so you could read the titles back then and probably uh, know more than the average person reading a book today about the book. But he says, man may be translated from hence into that eternal life without passing through death, although the human nature of Christ himself could not be translated uh, till he had passed through death. Okay, great. Even put exception clauses in your titles and everything. That's great. Uh, <laughs> And he wrote about this, and, as, and he was a member of the British and the Irish Parliament. And <clears throat> he was kicked out of the Irish Parliament in 1703. Now, those Irish know how to act uh, decisively. And uh, then he was kicked out of the British Parliament in 1707. And I've read his book. Uh, I read it at the Bodleian, Li Bodleian Library in Oxford. It's 92 pages long. And half of his book is, is basically about how he knows nobody's going to like what he's writing, but he's going to write it and say it anyway. And he did. And they burned, they burned most of his books. Fortunately, we still have a copy or two, as we say. And um, I, ha I have been able to get, uh, I have access through Liberty University, uh, a lot of these books as p in PDF form, and you can now get, either through Google Books, a lot of these writings that are footnoted here, or through EBSCO, if you have access to that resource, uh, in their, uh, seven, like their 17th century uh, literature, they have virtually everything online now. And so you can do your own research from the comfort of your own basement or, uh, house if you are able to uh, link up to those. So, his book was examined and pronounced blasphemous and it was burnt by the order of the house without having even heard its defense. Askell spent the last 30 years of his life in prison because of his book on the rapture. And this would tend to throw cold water on anyone desiring to make thoughts known on the rapture, I would think. He did not relate the rapture to the tribulation. He just taught that it could happen at any moment. So you're beginning to see people see that issue, you see. And he uh, probably would have been open to the preacher of rapture, but uh, he taught the idea that uh, we could be raptured at any moment. And then you have the case of Morgan Edwards. And this is a very developed view by a Welshman who was the founder of Brown University in Ivy League school today. Uh, Edwards was born there in Wales, likely heard George Whitfield preach as a young student, uh, and he was founder of Brown, as I said. He graduated from Bristol Baptist College or Bristol Academy in Bristol, England in 1744. I went there and visited the place. They had a record of him as a student but they didn't have any of his books or anything else about him, and they could have cared less about him as well. So he served some, uh, several small Baptist congregations in England for seven years before moving to Cork, Ireland, where, uh, by the way, he was a hyper-Calvinist, just for the record, uh, and became pastor of the Baptist church in Philadelphia in the American colonies. That was the most... Uh, Baptists were late to come to America, I, uh, relative to other denominations. I know that bothers some people in this room, but nevertheless, uh, Morgan Edwards is c considered the father of American Baptist history. And so to, he was ordained to the ministry by John Gill, a hyper-Calvinist from England there. And uh, so his major work is called A Materials Toward a History of the Baptists, and as I say, it's, he went up and down the eastern seaboard and recorded uh, early Baptist history. And 
As was typical of early American colonists, Edwards experienced a significant tragedy in his life. He outlived two wives and most of his children. And during a dark period of his life, he ceased attending church and took to drink. Now, that's not a very good Baptist, is it, Lonnie? Uh, not, not good at all. Uh, <clears throat> but he was excommunicated from his church. Now, that, you know. And, but he... <laughs> And then he made repeated efforts to be restored, and he was received back into the fellowship after he uh, got off the bottle, apparently, uh, in October 6, 1788, and therefore uh, thereafter lived an exemplary life, which was only about a year, but nevertheless. <laughs> uh, Baptist historian Robert Torbett described Edwards as a man of versatility being both a capable leader for many years and a historian of some importance. In temperament, he was eccentric and choleric. Now, if Tim LaHaye were here, he would tell us what choleric means, but uh, doesn't that kind of mean melancholy or something like that? I don't know. I'm not up on those things. Oh, well. With all his varied gifts, he was also evangelistic in spirit. Uh, another historian similarly says of Edwards, uh, he was scholarly, laborious, uh, warm-hearted, eccentric, caloric Morgan Edwards, one of the most interesting of the early Baptist ministers of our country and one of the most deserving of honor. Uh, his very faults had a leaning toward virtue's side, and in good works he was exceeded by none of his day, if indeed, if any of his day. He was an able preacher, a good man, but not always an easy man to get on with. Of course, he's kind of like me. You know, he's hard to get along with. Yeah, am I choleric? I thought I was sanguine. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Edwards first wrote about his preacher beliefs in 1742 as a student at Bristol College in order to fulfill assignment. So he was there three years, 1742 to 1744. And he said, quote, I will do my uh, possible, and in the, the attempt will work by a rule you have often uh, recommended, he's writing to his professor, to take the scriptures in a literal sense, except when that leads to contradiction or absurdity. Very uh, able men have already handled the subject in a mystical or allegorical or spiritual way. I like that little jab there. Edwards' work was first written in Latin during his student days in 1742. So years later, when he published in 1788, in other words, he translated this from the Latin and published it in 1788, the year he died, uh, in Philadelphia. And, uh, but he says that he did not change it any. So he basically just translated it into English and published it. By the way, the Pseudo-Ephraim sermon and Morgan Edwards' entire 52-page book is online at pre-trib.org. So it's there if you want to read it. Historian John Moore, quoting from Reverend William Rogers' sermon on Edwards, at Edwards' funeral, said, quote, There is nothing uncommon in Mr. Edwards' person, but he possessed an original genius. So in other words, he was an original type thinker, so he would have think outside the box. It's very clear that he wanted to do that in this particular paper. Uh, so thus, as an original thinker, Edwards apparently saw his views flowing from a literal reading of the Bible. Also, like Darby, Edwards developed these views early in life. I thought that was interesting. Edwards was between the ages of 20 and 22, while Darby was about 27 years old. Both men held their views throughout their lives. Almost a century before Darby developed and popularized a view of the second coming of Christ known as pre-tribulationalism or the view that Christians, believers, will be raptured or translated to heaven with Christ before the events of the tribulation, Edwards taught an amazingly similar view. Like Darby, his views on this matter were developed during an early phase of his life. So Edwards saw a distinct rapture three and a half years before the start of the millennium, and he taught the following about the rapture. This is from his writings. He said, uh, number two, the distance between the first and second resurrection will be somewhat more than a thousand years. I say somewhat more because the dead saints will be raised and the living change at Christ appearing in the air. 
referencing 1 Thessalonians 4.17. And this will be about three and a half years before the millennium, as we shall see hereafter. But will he and they abide in the air all that time? There's a, they, they went up in the air. They're going to hang out in the air three and a half years on a cloud. No, they will ascend to paradise or one of the many mansions in the Father's house, John 14, 2. So he's using these passages the same way we do. And disappear during the foresaid period of time. The design of this retreat and disappearing will be to judge the risen and changed saints. So he's got the bema going on, just like pre-tribulationalists do in that interval while the tribulation is taking place uh, on earth at the same time. Yeah, but he says, and judgment will begin at the house of God. He takes that passage that way. So he, he makes these points, as I've already pointed out. The main difference between modern pre-tribulationalism and Edwards is a time interval of three and a half years between the rapture and the second coming, instead of seven. So, as was noted early, Jonathan Brumham has pointed out that Darby held a three and a half year tribulation until 1845. Uh, so, Edwards reiterates his pre-tribulational position a little later in his book where he says, another event previous to the millennial will be the appearing of the Son of Man in the clouds coming to raise the dead saints and change the living and to catch them up to himself and then withdraw with them as observed before. In other words, what we read you earlier. This event will come to pass when Antichrist be arrived at Jerusalem in his con uh, conquest of the world and about three and a half uh, before his killing the witnesses and assumption of Godhead. So we see that Edward separates the rapture and the second coming. He goes on and says the last event and the event that will usher in the millennium will be the coming of Christ from paradise to earth with all the saints he had taken up thither about three and a half years before to justify against the accuser of the brethren to settle their future businesses and rewards. Millions and millions of saints will have been on earth from the days of the first Adam to the coming of the second Adam. All of these will Christ bring with him. So he believes, like Darby, by the way, that it's all believers from Adam to that point that will be raptured, uh, which we believe generally among pre-tribulationists it will be just the church, and the others will be resurrected at the second coming. So all these will Christ bring with him uh, the place where they will alight is the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. So we see uh, that Edwards had written, handwritten 140 sermons, and here toward the end of his life, other than his historical writings, and he wrote a, had a book published on how to raise money for college presidents, uh, which maybe some of y'all could... Uh, Read. Yeah, he was Baptist. Thank you, Daniel, my son. <laughs> that shows he was a genuine Baptist. How to raise money. <laughs> so we know uh, that get somebody started on a paper on um, a fundraising here can start with Morgan Edwards, I guess, or somebody like that. But when I was over in England uh, and in the British Isles, I looked at every library I went to, but also looked, uh, you know, online, as you can do, at all card, card catalogs, and it wasn't, there was only one copy of his book on the rapture in the, the, all of the UK, in a library, uh, the, and it was in the, at the University of, we, of uh, Wales, uh, Cardiff Library. So, I guess because he was a Welchman, perhaps, and nevertheless, what I'm saying is it's very, very, very unlikely Darby could have read Edwards. You see what I'm saying? Because there weren't any copies. Even It was published in 1788 in Philadelphia. This also means that, just think of this, here's a guy who, who published this book out of 140 sermons he could have done. So he must have thought it was important. So I'm sure when he was going up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States preaching, he probably preached on this a few times. And so this means that some people heard his views of pre-tribulationalism, and yet it took all this time for us to realize that he had taught this, you see. In other words, it went unobserved later on in, in church history. And so, uh, you know, there are others like this. So 
uh, there is a clear example. Also, John Bray had to pay off $500 uh, to someone for this fine. So even John Bray, an enemy of preacher relationalism, paid $500 for someone who found a pre-Darby rapture statement. Now, I want to also deal with uh, my paper doesn't have this, uh, with the, um, do, you have, do you have the appendix here? No? Okay. Uh, what, what is called the pre-conflagration view, I'll just go over this from memory here. And that was a view developed by um, Joseph Mead in 1629 probably around there, a Puritan scholar. I believe he was at Cambridge. And he was considered the father of premillennialism. And he, t he taught a view that before, uh, in other words, at the second coming, the church would be raptured up into heaven, and then there would be a conflagration, or Second Peter 3, burning of the earth for a period of time, you know, apparently days. And so the church would be raptured up into heaven and hover in heaven for a, a number of days and then return victoriously with Christ at the second coming. And that was a view held by the Mathers, Cotton, and Incre Richard Increase and Cotton Mather, uh, many American Puritans, um, and other and some in our group have said this is a preacher of rapture. Well, it's not a preacher of rapture. It's a view, it's a, a two-coming view of the second coming. It's not, it's very similar, I think, to Robert Gundry's view where he separates the rapture and the second coming uh, by a minute, uh, you know, number of hours. We call it the yo-yo rapture where you go up to come right back down, you know. And Therefore, uh, it's easy to identify uh, down through church history the pre-conflagration view that uh, he taught, uh, that Meade taught and was picked up by other, especially Puritan premillennialists. And he does have two stages, but it's not the tribulation that separates him. It's simply the burning up uh, or the judgment period of the earth where believers are rescued from that and then they return to a refurbished earth uh, days, perhaps weeks later, with Christ. And so that is not a pre-tribulational rapture, even though it has a two-phase coming. And some have mistaken that, as I say, as a form of pre-tribulationalism. And I think that needs to be distinguished as a view of the second coming, as two-stage second coming view. But what it does show you is even as early as the early 1600s, they're struggling, they're seeing differences in the two comings, you see? And they're, they're, they're distinguishing them as separate events. Because as we've pointed out many times over the 20 years here pre-trib, that uh, there are two distinct events, right? Uh, the gathering up and we like to put you know, different characteristics and show that that's different from the event of the second coming, et cetera. And so they're starting to see that. And it, later, as they begin to get away from historicism and back to futurism, they see that as the tribulation. But classic historicism sees the tribulation as going on during the church age, you see, for like 1260 years or, or a long period of time. And so they couldn't be pre-trib because they were in the tribulation throughout the whole church, pe church period, and that blinds them to see the two-stage coming. So with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation, and we will now uh, pick up for question and answers. And do you have that microphone? Yes. Okay. So I'll just stay up here, and if you have any questions... Or even, I, I even like to hear a few snide remarks here and there. Uh, you, can, you can throw those in. So just raise your hand. There we go. Right there. Uh, we will do the question-answer session. It's, it's on. Testing. 
Um, you had a, uh, some other guys in addition to these, you had a list of a whole bunch of um, people that talked about the rapture prior to Darby, and there were more than this in a, something you published. What, what was that? Uh, so that well, we can get a, I, I'm trying to get a comprehensive. Uh, well, that was, uh, some of those were the pre-configuration views that I have removed as pre-tribulational. Like Pierre Giraud, for example. He is not a pre-tribulationalist. Uh, put, the, put the mic back. I can't hear him. Sorry. So these are the, this is your new list? Yeah. Okay. And there are others that these scholars have found that we don't know their names yet. I know some of them, but uh, I'm not free to release them. After all, this is a secret rapture we're talking about. <laughs> By the way, let, let me make a comment about that. The term secret rapture was used by the Irvinites, which relates more to my last talk at the end of the conference here, as a rapture that only these special few enlightened would be able to see. Darby never held to the secret rapture. And back then it meant uh, people who had some special enlightenment uh, like the Irvinites who did not, who, by the way the Irvinites never taught or believed in a preacher of rapture but that's what I'm going to talk about in my last paper and people use that term uh, most pre-tribulationalists do not use the term secret rapture because it's, it's become a pejorative and I'm just saying, pre-tribulationalism generally is not thought of as a secret rapture, but some pre-tribulationalists have used it, and what they mean by that is that it is not a public event, like the second coming for all. It is for the church, therefore it is secret, you see, uh, from a public perspective. That's what we would mean if we were to use the term secret rapture. And, but Darby never used that term. Go ahead. Uh, great message, Tommy. Um, I'm just curious, your take, because all of us run into this constantly, this issue. And, uh, you know, how, how is it, that, in your opinion, uh, I mean, if we just done a poor job of, of, you know, taking what we hear in this room and getting it out, or they just do a better job, I mean, I'm always running into people that have never, ever heard. They, they've only heard the side that Darby created this thing, and they know nothing about the, 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 you know, the things that we exhaustively understand. And I'm just curious, why is it we, we constantly, I mean, we put this thing to bed in this group years and years ago. Here we are 20 years into, into mm -hmm. pre-trib, our conference is just at almost 30 years, and we've dealt with all these issues, we all get this message out, but why is it still seemingly not permeating the, 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 the typical mindset of the, of, the, of the average churchgoer in America? Because they still think, you know, we just came up with this thing. Yeah, well, I think it's because they don't want, they don't, in other words, this is a good argument against us, and that's, that's why I was saying we need to deal with it, we, we're dealing with it, uh, but people just don't want to hear that, and they think it's a good argument, but, you know, I've received or emails, phone calls, special secret packages and all of this about, do you know that Margaret McDonald came up with the rapture? Well, yeah, I've heard that. You know, I think I've heard that before. Uh, you know, like if you knew that what I knew, you would not be a pre-tribulationalist and everything. It has nothing to do with biblical exegesis. I think within the history of our movement, um, you know, our, our founders, when they first start teaching this, uh, immediately this was an argument that this is new. Uh, Darby's uh, associates who disagreed with him brought that up immediately and everything. But, uh, you know, it gets back to the fact that we are a Bible movement. In other words, and l only later did we get into church history and all of these kinds of things. And Darby did develop the preacher of rapture. 
on, you know, on, his, on his own. I'll be delivering a paper at the end of the conference to talk about the details of how he discovered that and everything, but we're finding that others before him did that, and uh, I think uh, it's explainable by the progress of doctrine, in other words, the development of doctrine. If you're not premillennial, you're certainly not going to be pre-trib, you see, and if premillennialism was whacked out for 1,200 years in the Middle Ages, which it was, was, you know, it was basically outlawed, uh, and you begin to have people starting to revive premillennialism, but historicism was the dominant eschatological view. So it was a historicist premillennialism. And then they had to get rid of historicism by returning to a more consistent literal interpretation, which didn't begin until the uh, early 1800s, late 1700s, early 1800s. And so as a result, that exploded uh, among Bible-believing Christians in, uh, in America after the Civil War, through the, what's called the Bible Conference Movement and everything. And almost all people who believed uh, in inerrancy and all of this began to move in that direction. Now we're seeing blowback, pushback. We, I think because we came to dominate evangelicalism so strongly, and the peak of our movement is the, probably the 50s and 60s, and then you begin to see uh, people you know, moving away from our movement and all of this, which is very typical. You have an ebb and flow in church history of popularity of things like this, especially in the area of eschatology. And uh, we're now in decline just because, and I would say mainly at the academic level, I think we're as popular as ever at the lay level, but history shows that if, if you lose it at the academic level, the next generation is going to go. You see, so that's why it's important that we did that. And this is why Tim LaHaye started this group to strengthen this area because we believe it's taught in the Bible, uh, regardless of its historical uh, pedigree. And we think it's just very, very clear there. But at the same time, we've had people who have uh, looked at church history and either they haven't thought about our views to pull, bring them out. It's just like uh, Leroy Fromm's four volumes, you know, Seventh-day Adventist guy, he's not going to bring up pre-tribulationalism, but he's got a very exhaustive view of, of church history. And, uh, you know, so you can't trust these guys, and that's why as our movement has developed, we, we've gotten some historians now that are looking into this, you know, they, they've surfaced, and we're finding that there are some uh, out there who taught our view. And so we can at least say if the, if the Bible teaches the preacher of rapture, you know, then why wasn't it found in the early church? Well, first of all, I would say it could have been there. Who knows? Uh, we have so many missing documents. Uh, secondly, uh, if it wasn't there, well, the early church immediately departed from the gospel now, what's more important than the gospel? Nothing. And if they miss the gospel, you know, then I think they could mess up something like the, the rapture. You know, I mean, there's, there's no gospel of grace at all in the early post-apostolic early church writings. And you wonder, I, I, you know, remember that song, you wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with something? You, you wonder where the gospel went when you look at the early church fathers, you know, uh, it's just not there. Uh, it's moralism and those kinds of things. And so as you begin to understand what we call the progress of dogma, even a guy like J. Edwin Orr 110 years ago uh, gave a lecture series that's a book called The Progress of Dogma, and he argues that there is a logic to systematic theology. And es ecclesiology and eschatology are the last two areas that one logically develops. Why? Because you have to get who God is, who Christ is, and what salvation is before you can get eschatology right, because eschatology is simply how everything ends. And so he, he goes on and says, and he was a post-millennialist, by the way, and he says that that's how theology developed historically in the church is, is based on the logic. And so the last 200 years now, last 100 years for him, 
uh, he says ha has been the development of eschatology and that is simply the application of the historical grammatical contextual uh, hermeneutic and the working out of the implications of that. Now, when God gave us the scriptures, the canon was complete, but there is a progress to the churches coming to understand what God gave us in the scriptures, and that's called the progress of doctrine or the progress of dogma. By J. N. Edward Nowhere, you can still get that book. Uh, and I think he's basically right. You look at someone like Preterist, they're the ones that love to taunt us in this area, but if those people would ever write a history of preterism, they would discover that their views of preterism weren't developed until the early 1800s themselves. Uh, there were some of their views that were developed before that, but basically nobody takes a preterist view of the second coming of the Olivet Discourse until Alcazar in 1614. Okay. But even they believed, you know, in a future second coming. And it wasn't until the 1820s that you basically have them saying, for example, Nero's the Antichrist. How, co how come uh, that doesn't bother them? You know, but they're bothered by our view of pre-trib as a supposed late development, you know, and everything. If I was a preterist, which I'm not, obviously, um, I'm a future guy, not a past guy. Uh, when it comes to eschatology. <clears throat> Soteriology is another, a, a different thing. But nevertheless, I'll quit talking in a minute. Ne uh, these people's eschatology was, very, was developed by a bunch of German liberals. Sorry, Johannes. And all, almost all of the sources of American preterism go back to these guys that that wanted a naturalistic interpretation of the book of Revelation, and they got it in preterism. And so here are these evangelicals coming along and saying, oh, we're, we're uh, breaking through with new developments in church history, and we're coming up with this naturalistic, you know, interpretation of the Bible in the area of eschatology. You know, so they're late, but, but it seems to be okay, yes. Good job, Tommy. You've already touched on what I was going to comment on, but... Um, I, if I talk long enough, I'll touch on everything. Yeah, and I almost uh, heard you talk so long, I forgot my comment. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I couldn't help but draw the parallels, the comparison between the arguments of the opponents of pre-trib rapture with the arguments Catholic apologists use against Protestantism. Ah. You know, they, they say that uh, sola scriptura was never taught, you can't find any early church fathers, same way with justification by faith. And so I, I think the parallel is that the, the Bible was hidden from the common person for close to 1,500 years. And so those doctrines that we hold so dearly today, including the pre-trib and the five solas, uh, they were hidden from the people. And so there wasn't a whole lot of stuff written on that throughout the dark ages as we know them. Care to yeah, comment? well, yeah, that's, that's a whole other point that I like to bring up, but forgot. Uh, by the way, I knew your question had to relate to Roman Catholicism, but uh, nevertheless, just think, for 1,500 years, the only one in two and a half thousand people could even read. It really wasn't until the 1500s that you begin to have the study the revival of Hebrew and Greek. And really, in a way, we've only been studying the Bible for 500 years in, that, in that, this new sense that Protestantism brought in, you know, with the rise of the middle class, the development of printing and all these things where these things were accessible. And so that's another point to be made is you only have a few people developing theology throughout the Middle Ages and things, and so things were more static. But apparently there were even people in the Middle Ages who wanted to break away from that papal, uh, you know, thumb there, you know, the oppression there. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Tommy, thank you for your presentation. Um, Pre-trib has often been accused of not being valid because it was not until Darby that it was developed. 
But a major challenge for pre-tribulationism today is the pre-wrath view. And the first published book was in 1990. Do you feel like there is any evidence prior to Bob Van Campen of the pre-wrath view ever in history? And second question, do you feel like that should be used as, a, as an argument against the pre-wrath view that it is recent? Well, yeah, I, I've used that argument against them, but uh, they try to go back and, and pick out one element of their view and say that it was taught by the early church. We did that with eminency, you know, in a similar way, but nevertheless, uh, their view as formulated by Van Campen, who, you know, rejected pre-tribulationalism, and then he rejected post-tribulationalism, so he had to come up with a uh, different view, uh, is not developed until the late 80s, I think, is when he came up with it. Or, Randy, when did you get that phone call? It was 82. So around 1980 is when he came up with that view. But nevertheless, nevertheless uh, it's a late development. And as formulated today, yeah, it's clearly a late development. I've had a debate with them before, with pre rafts and uh, they, they don't want to claim that and all. They want to just attack us on our view. Okay, uh, one or two more because I started early, I should end early because we're going to run out of video. Three minutes, Three minutes. okay. Uh, Tommy. The uh, scholars or the people who have written in this area, or the guy that, that wants to write in this area, he's bringing up with other people who uh, having a pre-trib um, rapture view. Can you say what period of time are these scholars <coughs> that he's found uh, are located? I'm not sure. On this? I'm not sure what you're asking. Okay, what I'm asking is, you're saying you can't reveal oh, uh, oh. the people. Okay. That's okay. just a single person. I know. A single person is, writing, is saying he may have found three other people that have written Just on from the 1600s. Okay, so that's what I want. 1600s is when he's saying. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Will you have him next year? Hopefully. Hopefully we'll have uh, William Watson next year. Don Perkins will be the last guy. Okay. Well, thank you. And you're dismissed.